Well, welcome to our Building Products Update webinar. Uh, we have just some really important information, uh, a whole lot of meat here that we're going to go through with you. I think it's one of the most exciting topics that Matt and I have worked through. Uh, a lot's going on in the industry. So uh, let's get into our discussion. Uh, first of all, some updates from Zonda. Uh, you might have heard this news that Zonda and BDX have joined forces. Zonda acquired BDX about a month ago. Uh, as part of that, that includes the Envision, the new home design platform. And if you're interested in building products and building products adoption, substitution at all, anything in the research universe, uh, you should be extremely excited about that uh, deal because it means that our team is now rolling up our sleeves, getting into all sorts of data that we've never had detail in before. So think like 225 manufacturers, 375,000 products. Uh, it's really the ecosystem where all these homes get configured by consumers. And we can see when they trade up, or they trade down, like what did they substitute in and where did it come from and what's attached to what? So uh, all of that analysis is going to be featured in uh, our Building Products Outlook research, which if you've seen any of this research, it's extremely thoughtful. Uh, our, the, way, the way we approach that month one is our forecast month. Month two, we're going into things that are going on between pros and channels and the complex pro. You're going to see a bit of that content from today. Uh, we were sniffing on that way before that really exciting announcement from Home Depot's acquisition came out. Uh, but you'll see kind of our thoughts on that. We cover that here. And now because of this great product data, we're going to have a really good sense of just what's happening next. So these are where all the real big surprises tend to happen in the industry, especially when it's turning like it is right now. Uh, a few other points. So if you are in the market for looking for new targeted new construction opportunities and you're in building products and you're trying to find builders and where their activity is and maybe super specific by price point or by builder, please take a look at Building Product Pro. Uh, that data is just exceptional, uh, really detailed geographic information. And then lastly, usually every time we do one of these, these webinars, there's many additional questions that come out saying, hey, that was all great information, but if there's something very specific to our industry or to our company that we need your help on. And if we have it, we're happy to share. But if there's something specific you need, please reach out to us and we can talk about getting that done on a custom basis for you. Uh, please stick around uh, at the end of this webinar because we're going to put a survey to you around your thoughts what you'd like to see covered, but also if you're interested in any of that detail, please let us know and we'll be sure to follow up to you. Uh, lastly, we're we're happy to mention that Trex, this webinar is brought to you by Trex. Of course, you're probably very familiar. They've got one of the best brand awarenesses in the industry uh, for all your ways your clients want to live outdoors. Uh, and of course, across all different types of uh, exterior builds and budgets. Uh, we're happy to have them sponsor this webinar. Three reasons why you might be interested in Trex as the number one name in outdoor living. Uh, they're planning tools. They've got all sorts of color selectors, product comparisons, a visualizer app. Uh, take a look at some of their new products, this cable railing and their hideaway fasteners and tools. And then, of course, uh, Trex is very well known for their activity, uh, very tightly knit with the pro. So uh, that's a great example of uh, how close relationships with the complex pro is executed. Uh, so uh, we're glad to have them sponsoring this webinar. Uh, you, you might actually see a bit of that uh, later on featured. That was uh, a surprise to us. We th th Their name will come up, so uh, you, you'll see that coming. So let's get into our discussion. First of all, what we're going to talk to you through is our update of what we think is happening in the industry. Some really big changes are occurring uh, right under our feet. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Complex Pro. If you've been hiding under a rock, and you have not heard about the big moves that have happened within the retail landscape with Home Depot acquiring SRS. That's all about the Complex Pro. There's a lot of implications there, though, too, uh, that will, will, will happen uh, over the next few years uh, as a byproduct of some of the shifts that that Complex Pro is doing and how they purchase. So we're going to talk about that, too. And then we're going to highlight some really interesting learnings that we're having around price points and brands. Uh, we think the concentration of revenue and profits will look quite a bit different as uh, this next kind of cycle begins to move up. So we'll give you more details on that. Uh, as a way of getting started, uh, here's the image that we shared 
on our forecast in January to all of our clients. And sometimes this is a very nice, simple way to think about what's happening in the industry. So in the background, you have a depiction of this kind of beautiful golden age of remodeling amid a housing shortage. And we have this kind of old timey building products vehicle that's on a somewhat rickety path to get there. We love the destination, but we can't help but highlight uh, all these areas of worry off to the side. And the street signs, which you maybe can see, uh, highlight Q1 and then Q2. We're navigating you know, turmoil and credit distress, issues that are happening right now within multifamily, commercial real estate. Uh, if we can get past that, we're really excited about the long-term outlook for home improvement and building products, but there are definitely some near-term issues. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that credit distress issue. Uh, first of all, let's talk about what we see happening over the next 24 months. So by portion of where we're at in the year, uh, that where we're at right now, we're calling the part of the year, first half 2024, uh, the middle income housing and home improvement squeeze. So if you're in the market, you likely are seeing your top line and your bottom line getting squeezed. Uh, we see, we're going to talk through this, but uh, the excess savings is going to be depleted. It's already done. We're seeing elevated defaults in credit card rates. There's this middle income credit induced remodeling activity that's largely pulled forward from the prior few years that that's unwinding right now. It's really hitting DIY hard. We're also seeing some deviations in pricing between building products uh, all over the map. Some, in, some price increases going on as well as uh, some pretty stringent price pushback, uh, including from some of the channels. Uh, we're talking like, like a large percentage of the cumulative price increase from 2020 to 2024, asking for a large piece of that give back. Uh, that's all happening at the same time. At the same time, we are seeing mortgage rates go sequentially lower with uh, some improvement with single family starts and potentially some growth in HELOC activity. Uh, right now, the forecast is for overall refis to grow about 25% year over year, and a decent part of that are going to be attached to some sort of cash out. So that's going to lead to a shift later on in the year in the second half of 2024. Uh, right now, our forecast is for mortgage rates to moderate modestly on a year over year basis, and then we'll begin to see uh, some of those deferred pro remodels. Think higher income projects, like the top 20th percentile in income begin to hit the market. So that's going to be luxury projects beginning to hit later on in the second half of this year. Uh, that's going to happen at the same time as multifamily really starts to weaken substantially. So our official forecast for multifamily starts was for it to decline minus 25%. Uh, but I can tell you that there's been a pretty heated discussion within, within our advisory group that's closest to multifamily that are working on some of the deal flow uh, speculating that it could even be more more of a decline, perhaps minus 50%. If that were to happen, it would all be in the second half of the year. Uh, we certainly would rather see it down less. Um, but the timing of when that impacts the market for building products would push it to the first half of 2025. So uh, the, the lag effect will hit then. At the same time as that issue happens, we're going to see what we believe is the begin of the surge in remodels from those postponed higher income projects and the thawing of these postponed moves, uh, perhaps a rapid increase in existing home sales. If you've heard us before, there's pretty interesting evidence that uh, we're calling it holding a beach ball underwater, that there's a whole lot of festering dissatisfaction with the home. And people are basically biding their time to fix either the, the home that they're in by remodel or to move to a different home. And that could be associated with a cash out HELOC surge, which would obviously drive uh, average price quite a bit higher for home improvement projects. After that, 2025 and beyond, uh, we believe what we're going to see, we, we've been calling this kind of the golden age of remodeling. That's really a comment on the level of home improvement and building product spending per household. So uh, it's almost in inevitable. Uh, there's a whole lot of analysis we've done behind that. But the precedent should be, and this is useful for you to have in, in the back of your mind, historically, if we saw rate hike driven deferrals and home improvement projects, we saw this in the early 80s. Uh, in, in, in some of the earlier decades and the, around the turn of the century, we saw that too, but it's poorly measured. Uh, in the early 80s, we saw deferred growth turn into over 20% growth uh, on a real basis. So that's the precedent. We think it could happen again. So let's get into some of the issues that are happening right now, the softness in the market. It's really different by segment of the market. So here's how I think about that. We have 85 million homeowners. Among those 85 million homeowners, if you think about the lower 40% in income, the lowest 40%, we knew that they would be hurt the most by inflation. They'd be hurt the most by declines in, in real income. 
Uh, and so we had expected their spending to, to soften on home improvement projects. Uh, and that's pretty much unfolding as we had anticipated. Uh, the biggest change to our forecast that happened late last year was when we learned more about what was happening around this middle income group. So middle income, 40th income percentile, the 60th income percentile. Think of uh, kind of the $60,000 household to call it sub $100,000 household. And uh, from what we can measure that that is the group, if there's pull forward in the home improvement market, it's almost entirely concentrated among that cohort. A lot of credit driven uh, excess home improvement activity that's really hitting pro and DIY right now. A lot of that goes to the big box retailers and that's unwinding. That's unwinding right now. So the softness that we're seeing, some of the destocking issues, we believe are fundamentally tied to that group. Uh, now contrast that with the uh, two income groups above that. Once we give, say, a, a, above $100,000 in income, the, the, the data that we have suggests that there's just significantly less pull forward, if any at all. It's the opposite. It's postponed home improvement projects. Uh, in fact, there's been some other additional research that's been done on that, suggesting that the reason there was there was a postponement happening was because a lot of those luxury households couldn't even get access to the products that they wanted. So we've got these kind of two issues. The overall market is softening because of postponement and because of this pull forward that's unwinding. Um, but that's going to flip flop later on this year, we believe. Now, what else is happening right now that's causing the home improvement industry to be so soft? Uh, one of it has to do with what's happened, the change that's happened in real incomes. So for about the last 18 months, we've had this nice pad of excess pandemic era savings that uh, households have been kind of chipping away at over time. So we sent this note to clients at the end of last year, December of 2023, that at the current burn rate in December, there was about a 2.3 month supply of excess savings remaining. So if you're working on the math on that, we're in April now. We are well past that 2.3 month in December. This data takes has a little bit of a leg. It hasn't been issued yet. Um, but from what we can measure, we are about a month past uh, the point where uh, we've entirely depleted that excess savings. Why does this matter so much? Uh, because so far, the market has been fairly resilient with declines in real income because households have been dipping into that excess savings. Uh, and, and in fact, here's a number for you. The increase in personal consumption expenditures in the overall economy last year, from this point to the same point last year, so call it January to January or February to February, we can use the monthly data, is almost dollar for dollar the same as the decline, the burn off of excess savings. So almost all of the increase in personal consumption, we could say was funded by depleting excess savings last year. And now it's empty. Now it's gone. Uh, add to that, this little nugget at the right. So uh, I had a statistician from the US Census send this to me this week. Uh, so if, you, if you've been following this at all, the census is having a whole significant tabulation problem with some of their data that they, they work with with the BLS, basically their, their household survey data capturing uh, you know, income growth, what's happening within the labor force, the household survey. And the point that they made to us, I have it highlighted in yellow, is essentially because of problems with people not filling out their surveys, non-responses, the official numbers, this is from the census, uh, are biased upwards. So they're skewed too high by 2% to 3%. And the most of that change appears to have happened from 2021 to 2023 to last year, skewed towards last year. So what does that mean? It means that the income growth that we were hoping was having ha happening that would be boosting home improvement spending right now is not happening. It also means that the excess savings that was buffering that declines in income is gone. So it's no surprise that the market is getting fairly soft, especially among that lower to middle income part of the market. Uh, this is what also happened at the same point. We saw a, uh, a surge in credit scores, especially among credit cards immediately after the pandemic because people were locked at home and they got excess stimulus dollars. And when that happens and you can't spend your money, you pay your bills. So uh, what we saw happen was credit scores went up, borrowing went up, people spent, especially this is that middle income group, spent more on home improvement projects, spent more on vacations, more on a whole number of things. And now they're beginning to default at a faster rate uh, on a credit score adjusted basis. Uh, some research from the St. Louis Fed suggests that the current pace of default 
is faster than we've ever seen it in the history of the data. Now it's con concentrated among a super specific cohort of buyers. It's not usually who buys our product, but that's absolutely hurting that DIY part of the market. And if you're trying to get your head around what that actually means, I, I had to include this just as an idea. Uh, if you remember back years ago, maybe you experienced this, BMG or Columbia House, uh, if anyone ever purchased one of their buy eight CDs for the price of one or buy 12 CDs for a penny, uh, that is essentially an example of credit-induced pull-forward inaction. You get all the consumption at once, you get eight CDs all at once, and then you're stuck. Then you have to pay the piper. So uh, I, I, I couldn't help but think of this when I saw, <laughs> we sent this to our clients this summer, uh, around July 4th of 2023, one of the big retailers offering for the outdoor barbecue space uh, for $1, you can get this barbecue, uh, no credit needed at all. It's the same marketing ploy as the eight CDs for the price of one. Uh, and of course, the mechanics of credit-induced pull-forward works the same, that you, you get all the consumption now, and then you have to pay for it later. Now that's unwinding. Now we're lapping that, and that's beginning to soften. So, uh, and, and just one last nugget, and then we'll, we'll go through some of the other issues that are going on. Maybe you saw this bit in the news uh, a showroom, luxury showroom. They had a lot of Perch has a lot of luxury showrooms on the West Coast uh, closed this month, uh, temporarily closing all their showrooms, basically doing a strategic review of what they want to do. Uh, people were so excited when Perch hit the market in 2009, 2010. It was going to change how people experienced home improvement and remodeling within a showroom, ultra high end environment. And now they're shuttering, or now they're at least pausing uh, out of concern. So the market's shifting pretty significantly. And uh, why that's interesting is because all of that carnage that's been happening in DIY and we're having perch shutdown and other issues, all that carnage is happening at the same time as we see Home Depot announce the largest acquisition that they've ever done, uh, $18 billion. And so we have to talk about what's happening with the Complex Pro and what's changing within the channel and distribution landscape. We, we sent a note to clients in February that, you know, essentially, we think 2024 is one of the most strategically important years for distribution, for channels, uh, and it's going to set up uh, likely a shift between the pricing power uh, and, and how some of the inter other categories uh, interact with each other, too, going forward. So let's talk about this briefly. Uh, a bit of context. Mid-year 2023, Home Depot's Investor Day. Uh, just an exceptionally well done investor day, but uh, one point that I would call out. Uh, so of course, Home Depot talks about their base case of industry growth and then their accelerated case. And then they like to peel back the layers of the onion on what the ingredients were in that base case and the accelerated case. So in their base case, uh, Home Depot pointed out that they're going to invest in the internet, the internet connected experience. So that's like using their, their, uh, their apps and their homedepot.com, which touches a whole bunch of things. They're going to have some new stores, but they've always done new stores. And then they're going to focus on pro market share gains. Now, when they talked about their accelerated growth case, they talked about potentially some M&A, and then they basically doubled down and said, and, and we're going to even do more pro market share gains. So uh, we knew Home Depot was looking pretty hard at uh, pro labor, basically as the battleground for 2024 to 2030. Now, this is really an interesting environment because, uh, you know, as we said, we think that the, the backdrop is set up for us to have one of the most interesting surges in pro remodeling uh, later on this decade that we've ever seen in the history of the data. And that's happening at the same time as there's uh, a setup for a labor shortage more than we've ever seen in the history of the data too. Uh, if we see half uh, the cohorts of home improvement contractors retire uh, that are reaching that 65 age, uh, it'll roughly put us in the ballpark of where we were labor-wise in as 2018 levels, but with much higher level of contract or much higher level of demand. That's a case for uh, pricing power to be much different than it was years ago. Uh, then in February, Ted Decker, Home Depot CEO, made this comment. He clarified that we're going to invest in new assets and capabilities to better serve the complex pro. Complex pro. This is a different type of pro. Uh, we're good. Matt's going to give you some colors on this in a moment, uh, but uh, Matt, why don't you walk our listeners through uh, how, how we think about what's happening within these channels and the Complex Pro? Sure thing. Thanks, Todd. Um, 
Yeah, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting term, complex pro. We we I had not heard that before in many years in the industry. And the other thing I noticed a couple of pages ago on your uh, chart that you shared from the depot, Todd, is that there was a very small bar to the right for um, I think they even called it potential acquisitions after naming uh, pro share growth twice on the same on that same chart. There was a one little note for. Uh, for M and A, which we know has, uh, you know, has certainly been a very different, um, very different story in the last few months, right? Um, and the other thing that I think is, uh, is interesting, um, is sort of where they were, um, very recently, and that's what we're going to talk about in a few for a few slides here. Um, so in February, we distributed our first building products out product outlook channels issue for the year, where we do one each quarter. And um, this was before the additional DCs were announced and, of course, before SRS. So this is our backdrop. And I'm sorry, we needed to gray out the factors on the left here in deference to our uh, to our subscribers. But the green pluses and the red minuses pretty much tell the overall story. This was the uh, pro progress report we put together and how the different players were doing at servicing the pro channel. And in case you can't read the columns here, we've got the depot first, of course. Then we have Lowe's, um, lumber yards and pro dealers, direct from manufacturer and pure online. We didn't issue a final grade here, but you know I think it's clear the depot was not getting an A back in February. And in fact, when you look at this sort of sea of red and green, they were really only ahead of uh, of Lowe's. Um, and we'll show you in the next few pages kind of what was happening to uh, to drive our, our ratings here. So throughout 2023, the backlogs for the smallest pros were actually relatively good. Um, they were higher than the beginning of the year where we indexed these at 100 and also higher than their larger counterparts. They even saw a pretty good spike in the third quarter, but it was fairly short lived as you start to see the backlogs come down, you know, and their projects tend to be smaller scale. So backlogs can change very quickly versus some of the, uh, some of their larger counterparts. And a bit, a bit, so a bit of context. Really, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm just gonna say a bit of context on this chart. I, I think this is just an excellent point, Matt, because, uh, you know, we, we would hear a lot of discussion, even among the retailers on their earnings calls, pointing to that uh, both big box retailers, that they were gaining share of uh, professional contractors. They weren't calling them out as complex pros, but basically they were gaining share. And uh, when we would look at our like by cohort analysis, which I know you're going to touch on, you know, we, we saw a very mixed bag of results. But one thing that was clear was like, if there was a group of contractor that was doing well in Q3, Q4 of last year, it was the smallest, call it like a trunk slammer type contractor. And that happens to be the contractor that has the most exposure to the big box retailers. So it was like a, you know, they 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 benefited by virtue of having exposure to the right tier. But the the book of business for the rest of the market, in some cases the most profitable parts of the market, uh was 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 a different story. Yeah, exactly, Todd. Thank you. And and, and what we're looking at here is project activity, but but that's not the same as project margin, right? And at the same time, these pros are really feeling squeezed. Um, you know, the uh, overall market activity is slowing, which obviously means more pros competing for the same jobs. And so we looked at how their um, how their project margins change. So what we have here is um, year ending twenty three in black, and then year ending year. Uh, ending January 24 in purple. So the purple numbers are more current. Um, and so all but the smallest pros, all but this um, $250,000 group again, um, we're seeing a margin contraction. Um, and uh, you know the purple bars are, are quite sizable for, for the next few groups. It's so only the smallest we're seeing a minor increase, you know, minor 10 bullet point. However, it was still less than the previous year's decrease. So said differently, even the margins of the smallest pros were lower now than they were in 2022. And the reason this really this really matters to folks like the depot and all sales channels is what they do about that. 
And so what we see is when the pearl margins are squeezed, they can't do a lot on the pricing side, right? The market dictates what they can charge. People are generally getting competitive bids, but they can look to control their product costs better. And the way they do that is by switching. They shop around more, both channels, products, brands. And so what we do is we track switching intensity. In this case here, it's these um, circles on the right, and it's a ratio of um, people saying they switch more divided by the people who say they switch less. And so the smallest pros are switching the most, right? There's four and a half actively switching for each one who's switching less. And this has been the case fully throughout the year. Um, and then the other group switching a lot is actually the largest pros at 360. And uh, this is fairly new. It's something that we're going to watch. It's a bit of a sign, of the, a sign of the times, but the largest pros tend to be both more channel and brand loyal. So we're going to watch and see if they can still continue to switch at a high level. But um, but we can pretty much guarantee the small ones will be. So, so yeah, to your point, Todd, we felt like small pro activity almost might have been a little bit of a head fake to the depot at the beginning of this year because backlogs were coming down they were shopping more and so yes there was this period that they were looking um relatively stronger but it was pretty short-lived and so if you uh if you subscribe to uh actually one moment here yeah so if you've joined us before or you subscribe to BPO, you're pretty familiar with this chart. This is the status of the channel uh, share of wallet changes for 2023. Pure online and uh, direct from manufacturer just dominated. Um, every contractor segment was, uh, was shopping more. These are net changes. So again, people who are shopping more minus people who are shopping less to show the momentum. And these, this was a, a story throughout the year, it's continuing this year. And we're not picking on the depot here because they actually fared better than some other retail players, uh, most other retail players like hardware stores, but they also ultimately lost a lot of ground to, um, to the pro channels below, the lumber yards, the pro dealers, ABC, Beacon Lansing, and SRS. And so after the February issue, the timing of all this was pretty interesting. In case you missed it, this was an interview with the um, the president of HD Canada when the new when the four new DCs were announced. And we actually found it to just be an excellent and kind of refreshing view of really the pressure Depot was facing. You know, investor calls are one thing, but we felt like this was more you know kind of what they were living every day um, and really thinking about the complex pro. And the headwinds that uh, that are producing those share of wallet, you know, kind of frankly ugly trends that we were looking at a moment ago. So there's some interesting excerpts that we've highlighted here, and I would say here are some of the more telling ones. Um, serving these kind of customers, complex pros, through our retail stores is not optimal. Then gets a little more direct and says, when you do things like block off the aisles, have to fetch products atop storage units, you have to cobble together product from other stores. It is not the greatest, quote, customer experience. Um, you know, and I think this is a very honest portrayal. You can only adjust the retail footprint experience so much. The, you know, the product variety, inventory, the ability to get it in and out of us, you know, simply get it in and out of a store when they talk about 20, 24, 20 foot pieces of lumber. You know, we, we just don't have the space and ability inside our store to carry that. So what, what a great setup for DCs, um, which almost felt like a baby step versus, you know, sort of what came next, then going all the way to SRS. And you're familiar with the deal at this point. Um, monumental deal, um, very high multiple. I believe it was a 16 EBITDA, just extremely, uh, extremely significant. Um, you know, suddenly they are catering to um, that business that they've been losing, you know, at the pro, uh, at the pro dealers, you know, getting the experience that they really want, being able to provide the, uh, the customer experience that they just talked about a moment ago. And, and beyond that, and, and we know all of the talk right now is um, SRS continuing to operate independently. 
That said, there are still uh, 700 locations, 700 truck fleets, and 700 yards to put product when you look at the, the three sides of SRS's business. So over time, we see this as just providing tremendous network effect to to really meet two of the biggest challenges retail has with pros, right? Having enough product and inventory and being able to, to deliver it. So this was a very exciting uh, movement for us. We think the depot uh, really just made a uh, kind of a great chess move. We'll circle back at the end and uh, and talk about what this could, uh, kind of where this could go from here if, uh, if you'll uh, indulge us to dream a little bit. Yeah. Um, thank you, Matt. That's some really good context. I think, you know, there's so much focus on roofing and roofing obviously is a special part of the market, but that that's really, that's only a small part of the value story here. Uh, it's, it's all the attached relationships that go beyond roofing. Let me, let me talk about what's happening within this kind of shifting and uh, what this implication of pro shopping more at pure online, what we think it might mean for some of the product categories. I'm going to touch on some brands too. So here's how I think about this. Uh, thinking about the dollars that the pro contractors actually control. So excluding MRO, uh, from what we can measure, there's about $375 billion of pro-contractor spending uh, that excludes labor. These are these are pro-contractor purchased products uh, in the U.S. Of that, we really see about $225 billion that's actually purchased or acquired by the pro. So there's another subset that maybe someone else is influencing the product and they're involved in the install. $225, though, the lion's share, uh, they're actually the ones that are purchasing the product. Uh, because of the churn that's happening between channels. So a pro was going to one channel before, especially during the pandemic and mid product shortages. And now they're going to a different location. Maybe they're going to pure online or they're going you know, direct from manufacturer or to some of those traditional distributors. Uh, we think there's about $40 billion worth that basically is at risk because these are Pros that are now your your product, if you're a manufacturer, has to compete with a different brand than it did before. Uh, even if you've got products in both locations, uh, it's just basically your 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 product is being considered in a new light than it was before. Uh, of that, we think about eight billion dollars is likely to be swapped. So just because of the natural friction that's occurring as the pro contractors change where they buy you get this substitution play of different products and brands being swapped for one another. And so when I when I first saw the SRS acquisition announcement, one of the thoughts that I, I went to was like, boy, it's a really piece of that $8 billion that Home Depot is attempting to recapture here. Um, obviously, not all of that's roofing, but a small portion, portion might be. So uh, this matters, obviously, for all the categories that care about the pro at all, because part of, theirs, uh, part of their, their attachment to those pros is at risk. So let's talk about uh, the mechanics of what we think might happen as complex pros are shifting where they buy. They're going to either e-commerce locations which, uh, or manufacturer direct. So when I talk about pure online, uh, think of like an Amazon or a build.com, someplace that doesn't have brick and mortar. This is not just an omni-channel. So uh, just as a bit of anchoring here, the pro assortment of products is actually being done pretty well by the distributors and dealers that work with them. And I'm picking on, let's use Home Depot here too, but we know that the pro uh, the pro uh, channels uh, do an exceptional job too. Uh, there is a lot of power tools available at Home Depot if you've ever visited, uh, but nowhere close in terms of scale of how many is available on say some of these uh, e-commerce sites. So Amazon, if you just type in the phrase power tools gives you over 90,000 results. That's an impossible number to digest. Uh, so if we were to sort it down to like, what type of, say, miter saws? How many miter saws can I get at Home Depot today? Same store delivery. Uh, by my house, I can get 29 saws potentially, which is a great number. But that's still very small compared to how many you could get delivered tomorrow at no cost from Amazon, 333. And I'll notice that Amazon is pointing to me uh, brands that I've never heard of. And I like doing woodworking. Uh, but uh, it very much changes the consideration and the selection experience of pros and, and consumers, but especially pros, as pros begin purchasing differently. So uh, what, what do we know about the mechanics of what this will do in the market? Well, we don't know for sure, but I'll show you what we think. There's a lot of, uh, th there's a lot of research in other industries that we might learn from. So let's just pick on music. Um, but what I'm gonna say also applies, it's been you know looked at in terms of other forms of media. Uh, the same conclusions apply to dating. 
uh, think of like people, how, how people used to date within their community and then they would go online. Like just when you increase the number of participants in a market, it changes how people make decisions. So let's just think about what happened in music years ago. Uh, it used to be that you would walk into a store, they would feature maybe some compilation of the top 40 and then there'd be some other selection of CDs or uh, tapes or cassettes or that you could get. But it was very difficult to get something outside that list. Uh, fast forward to today, now people consume within the industry uh, from a much, much larger pool uh, of options, similar to going and buying on Amazon uh, versus having maybe a top 40 selection. You now have you know, 225,000 professional artists that you can you can stream their information and their music immediately through, through, uh, through Spotify right now. Uh, so why do we care about this? Because the mathematical principles that apply when you add a, a large number of participants to a market in an open market changes the concentration of the profits. Uh, this is what I mean. So, uh, and, and this is really, you're familiar with the Pareto rule. This is a, a, a more refined view of that. So uh, here's how we think about that. The red line is what we might think of as traditional distribution. This would be like a Pareto rule. So we're uh, the top 20% of your customers account for about 80% of your profits. Uh, we're pretty familiar with that. And that was the case for even the music industry in the in the mid-90s, but uh, the, the case for a number of other industries too. So in 2004, when the uh, digital music scene first began to hit, uh, we saw a lot of speculation by some people within the industry that they thought, oh my goodness, uh, now you're going to have all these new participants in the market and they're going to kind of the, the man is no longer going to step on their neck. So, so you're going to have all these new participants in the market uh, and we're going to see a much more equal share of revenue because of that. So they they call this kind of this fat tail. Uh, so this gray line is what perfectly equal revenue would look like as opposed to the red line, which is traditional distribution. Uh, is that what happened? No, no, not at all. Uh, what we learn is when you go from a controlled number of market participants to a much larger amount of market participants, it drastically increases the concentration of the winners. So what we see today on Spotify, uh, even among the professional musicians who are earning, say, over a million dollars, is that you have kind of this general pool of many, many participants. And then you have Taylor Swift, who is just earning the lion's share, these superstar uh market dominant brands that control a lot of uh, a lot of the pricing power. Uh, and this isn't just a, I'm, I'm picking on music. This isn't just a music story. This is the case across a lot of industries. It's you know essentially a a function of what happens when you when you open up to larger and larger groups of market participants. So why are we talking about this? Because our perception is that uh, when we did the study, we were surprised at the penetration of how many pro including complex pros were buying something online. They were going online to uh, non-brick and mortar retailers. And this doesn't mean they're buying all their products. Uh, what our sense is, is that they're still buying most of their products at traditional retail or traditional wholesale, but there might be a few select products that they're monitoring online, especially uh, in some cases, higher end upgrades that they couldn't find, it wasn't in stock. Uh, why does this matter so much? Um, because when we think about the next part of the market that could grow or where we kind of see the market shifting from today, one of the things that we talked about before, right now, the whole market is getting beat up a little bit because we have these postponed projects going on, these other issues with excess savings being depleted, the middle income group is really being battered, but we expect that to twist. We expect it to twist where a year from now, we're in a situation where the first part of the market to rebound is the luxury part of the market, most likely, because that's who has the equity. Uh, we saw this before. I had to highlight this example from coming out of the financial crisis, luxury spending rebounds to pre-crisis levels. This was printed in October 18th of 2010. Uh, the housing market was still in turmoil at that point. It was going to languish for another two years, uh, even before single family rental uh, <laughs> started getting involved. So uh, why are we talking about this? Because the, we have a setup right now where we think the part of the market that's going to rebound the fastest uh, is tied to the higher price point luxury remodels, likely funded out of HELOC. And to give you a sense of the scale, uh, if we measure the growth in home equity just since 2020, just since the pandemic, we have 12 trillion with a T more home equity than we did at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, that's an enormous number. 
uh, if if homeowners were to extract just the home equity gains that they've had since 2020 and spend it in a year, which they're not going to do, but if they were to do that, the scale of that is so large, it'd be equal to roughly 43% of GDP. I mean, it's a silly number. And so the bar is so low for HELOC activity and extraction in 2023. It's so low that we think any modest amount of improvement will look like a large percent growth and it'll show up what looks like luxury remodels. So what are the brands and what are the categories that stand to benefit the most? So we did some interesting work on this and let me just kind of share our findings. So when you think about luxury brands, uh, luxury, luxury brands are one of those things that every company that manufactures product probably can point to something that they manufacture and they'll tell you it's luxury. Uh, but then they might sell it for $100 at a big box retailer. So what's really luxury? Well, we, we've got to run an experiment and because we're interested in pricing power of luxury products. So as you might know, our group is involved in the fielding work of the cost versus value analysis, which basically looks at realtor perceptions of various remodels. And so it's a super in-depth process where we take thousands and thousands of realtors, describe a very specific remodel, and we ask them, like, what did you believe that this remodel would add to the typical type of home that you sell? And so once we have a good sense of the type of homes that they sell, the markets they're in, and we, they, they filled out kind of their view of what those the, the values of those remodels would do, this year, uh, we followed up with a special question. And we asked them, uh, okay, so do you think that brands matter a lot in terms of giving you more resale value? So this is someone who's involved in the sale of a home. They're really, really close to what the consumers look at, what they talk about. Uh, and uh, if they said they did, then we followed up up and asked them the next question of like, okay, name the brand. So they had to actually have a name in order for us to, to believe that they knew which brand drove the value. And so we saw really big differences. Uh, and here's the final rub, which I think is really exciting. Because we knew what type of homes, what price point of homes these realtors worked with, we were able to compare the, the brands that the realtors that sold luxury homes uh, had top of mind as opposed to the brands that were suggested by those who sold maybe kind of the part of the broader market or entry-level homes. And so what we learned was uh, there is some standout brands that have very different exposure between luxury consumers and uh, the broader market. So let me pick on Bosch. So it, it, this is just the kitchen appliance subset. We have all the detail for all these different product categories, but uh, Bosch is at the far right. Great brand awareness, uh, realtors who sold luxury homes like them, realtors who sold entry-level homes like them, Bosch is doing great. Uh, but the thing we that we note is that the gap between the purple line, which is the luxury realtors, and the black line, uh, which is the regular uh, realtors, is not very big. So our general conclusion here is that Bosch has is doing a great job marketing. They're doing a lot of great things. But we wouldn't necessarily say that Bosch is overly skewed only to luxury. Uh, that they have just done a great job of brand awareness in general. Contrast that with Sub-Zero or Wolf Appliances, uh, who here you can see their purple lines are far higher than the same brand when it was mentioned by those who sold to a lower tier of housing. So we would definitely expect when the market begins to turn positive for the luxury part of the market, uh, that the as the luxury part of the market grows for housing, Wolf and Sub-Zero should get an incremental lift above and beyond what otherwise might happen. Uh, contrast that with Samsung. Again, Samsung does a lot of great things, um, but uh, the luxury realtors who were suggesting brands that they thought added the most value were more likely to suggest other brands than Samsung, whereas uh, the, the kind of broader realtor group like Samsung a lot. So uh, this gives us a good sense of how to think about the outperformers among the luxury market as the luxury mar market begins to rebound. Okay, so why are we talking about that? Because this is the distribution of the entire universe that we analyzed, 509 brands rated by all these realtors. The difference between what luxury realtors rated and recognized as important brands driving value versus what everyone else said. And at the left, you have these deep negative numbers. Those are all basically these low-priced fighter brands that are somewhat unknown by luxury realtors but are used a lot by these entry-level realtors. Then you have kind of this very flat middle. And then to the right, this steep, 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 steep curve. So think about the concentration here of 509 brands. There were really only 31 brands that uh, were, there was a big enough difference versus the broader market for us to identify them as a watch list to uh, keep an eye on when luxury spending recovers. They had to be one standard deviation above the mean in order to qualify. 
um, even above that group, there's nine luxury brands, which were really uh, standout, uh, compelling brands, which uh, were were far outperformers. I'm talking like three to four standard deviations beyond normal, like exceptionally. Which brands were they? They had seven times more influence versus all those other aspirational luxury brands. Again, this is of a universe of 500. Well, I'll give you the top four. So, uh, and then this, this is all information that we share with our clients. Uh, if you want more detail, you can reach out, reach out to us. But the number one brand that uh, these realtors rated as the most important, uh, if you're buying a luxury home, as opposed to kind of the broader market, uh, number one was, interestingly, James Hardy cladding. Uh, and it was by a lot. This was over four standard deviations above the mean. So we we would view that as generally a pretty positive indication of uh, pricing power as the market begins to improve. Uh, number two was Trex, uh, then Tesla, uh, and obviously not the car, but the uh, solar roof. Uh, the luxury realtors were calling that out by name, and then Wolf Appliances. Uh, so we, we, incidentally, we didn't know that Trex was going to be involved in sponsoring this webinar uh, when we did the research. So I'm glad that it worked out okay. Otherwise, they might have been frustrated with us. But it's great to see them doing such a great job uh, pushing that volume. Uh, we we do have other brands, which we have to save some of those for our clients. If you want more information, reach out to us on that. Uh, but this is how we tend to think about the groups that are most likely to see sales begin to swing as the market grows. So uh, with that bit of context, let's talk about what the shift is between price points and kind of pro-customer experience of where we see things going within the broader market and where this kind of acquisition leaves leaves things placing, uh, we, we, we think. Matt, what, go ahead. Why don't you talk about this? I know you've given this a lot of thought. Matt, I, I don't know if you're here. I'm not hey, Todd, you. sorry, I lost, <clears throat> I lost my signal for a moment there. Thank you. Um, so a couple of factors we've been really digging into today and, and lately in general are share of wallet shifts across channels, vis-a-vis uh, -vis customer experience, and then also um, various price points, as Todd just covered. And our survey work really shows that, um, you know, Home Depot stores provide a... Um, a basic, um, you know, generally capable pro experience when the supply chain is healthy. Um, better, frankly, when it's not as healthy. And it works uh, works well for DIYers, um, the smallest contractor segment, as we kind of delineate, delineated earlier, but struggles with the large pros. And at the same time, when we think about products, the depot is really good at category management. I mean, they're up there with Walmart, some of the best grocery chains. Um, it, it's it's really a science, and it's around selling an efficient set of products for the you know shelf and storage space that you have. That doesn't really allow you to get into a lot of luxury products because they tend to be lower market share a lot of time and just inefficient from uh, typical retail metrics. And frankly, some of their manufacturers, you know, like some of the ones Todd just talked about, might not want their might not want their products on the shelves at the depot anyway. So here's where we look at some of the other um, some of the other channels we've been talking about today and studying. Um, and again, we're on this uh, kind of pro experience um, versus price point. Um, and the in-store improvements can only kind of dress up the depot so much, you know. It, for those of you who've been listening to the investor calls, th there's been some, you know, interesting points around uh, localized product assortments, uh, trade credit, better order management, all, all all important stuff, but arguably not game changers for a lot of pro contractors. Um, however, um, you know, so this kind of puts them stuck in this left corner, which is obviously not where you want to be low in the experience and price point uh, standpoint. But then we look at their recent developments at the depot and significantly kind of changing the game here um, between, you know, their acquisitions, uh, construction resources, now SRS, along with the additional DCs um, that that article, um, you know, supported earlier really pushes their impact impact significantly further out and what we're calling the complex pro kind of efficiency frontier curve here, really where you want to be in this chart on the upper right. And it also just opens the mind to 
kind of what what could be next for the depot after showing the the willingness and um, foresight, frankly, to to buy an SRS. You know, what could they do with skilled trades, specialty contractors, um, contractors who focus on product categories that are frankly much broader and more complex than roofing, think uh, more brands, more SKUs, more colors, options, accessories, um, places that are more one-stop shopping like ABC. There's, there's really so many places they could go now that they have shown that they are willing to do SRS and and again, thinking about that chart that that Todd showed earlier, very big difference to gaining share through new stores and you know trade credit programs, kind of some more basic retail notions. Going ahead and purchasing both construction resources, but to a much larger extent, SRS has really shown their ability to kind of meet the pros where they uh, where they want to purchase. Um, we showed the share of wallet gains at places like this. And, you know, without hurting their DIY or small contractor orientation, you know, we think the depot has done an, an excellent job at also getting at this um, kind of complex pro, uh, you know, preferred shopping venues. Go ahead, Todd. You know, I'm just going to say, like, like I, I hope it's not lost to everyone. Like, look, think of the irony of the timing here. So DIY and parts of the market are getting clobbered because of the issue that we talked about with that middle income pull forward, um, you know, home improvement, especially the part of the market that they serve directly is just getting hammered right now. And we think it's going to rebound and we're very bullish about the long term. And evidently, you know, so is, so is the, uh, the, the leadership teams of these, uh, the, the, these large companies, but the irony of making the investment now, the timing matters, uh, especially of that magnitude. And, and I, and I hope that the construction resources one uh, it does not get, kind of lost in the shuffle here because uh, Perch, the one that shuttered, shuttered their doors uh, and construction resources look very similar from the outside, right? But this gives us a sense of just uh, how deliberately we're seeing things reshuffle amid kind of this next phase of growth. So uh, this feels like a recipe for the overall kind of pricing power, you know, closeness to the pro Whoever controls that pro contractor or is closest to that pro contractor will have just significant leverage, we think, around product selection, pricing, the bundling, all these other things. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty pretty exciting backdrop. Let's uh, let's just summarize and then any other questions we can hit. So to review, I'm going to give you a forecast here because of everyone's patience. So we see risks increasing for building products, likely culminating in the first half of 2024, which is where we're at right now. So for new construction you should be thinking about a scenario where you're seeing about 7% revenue growth. Uh, that's with starts down 7% year over year, but you have this dynamic of uh, timing issues of these single family homes that were started last year and a little bit more starts growth dollarizing this year. And then these multifamily units that are being delivered also dollarizing, but that's going to begin to fall off in the second half of this year. On the remodeling side, uh, you should be thinking about something in the ballpark of zero to three percent growth with significant year-over-year -year declines in the first half, which is where we're at right now. And we think a meaningful rebound, especially among the big project, higher price point products by Q4. It's always difficult to call the quarter, but the comp structure is so much more advantageous as we get later on this year. It's an easier comp. So it breaks up really different by price point. Uh, medium term, uh, there is a structural shift underway positively. Uh, think about, we've called this holding a beach ball underwater. So we should be thinking about a scenario where we, at some point in time in the next 24 months, we see people basically rematch a rebound in mobility, uh, something in the ballpark of maybe what we saw in the early 2000s in terms of uh, household mobility rate, as well as uh, postpone major remodels led by higher income consumers. Uh, and lastly, uh, there's this battle for pro contractors that is absolutely well underway. And that's a recipe for major swings in market share and uh, concentration of revenues and profits. So don't be complacent. Uh, that's that's our advice to clients. Uh, this is the time to be very deliberate and understand what part of the market you're exposed to and and how some of those underlying issues are shif uh, shifting. So uh, thank you for attending. Please uh, be sure to stick around to uh, take our survey at the end. Uh, Matt, I don't know. Do, do we have time? I think we got a minute for any Q and A. It looks like there might be a couple of questions here. Amanda, do you want to share any questions? Sure, I'd love to. 
So uh, Melissa Hardison had a question. She wanted to know, what do you mean by pro and complex pro? Matt, go ahead. Great question, Melissa. And, uh, you know, and to be candid, you can't see the air quotes that we often put up when we talk about complex pro on video here. This is a term that uh, I I never heard in about 20 years in the industry until the Home Depot earnings call. And uh, they've started to they started to coin that term. And uh, really right before some of these um, some of these bigger acquisitions, it, it it felt to me like a little tip of the hat that, hey, within within our retail, you know, kind of confines, we can't be all things to all people. The complex pro is is running a business. He or she has much broader needs than someone who is, you know, maybe doing a a a drainage pipe today, and you know, and their uh, handyman doing some, you know, a roofing fix next week. You know, hey, they work fine for them, but the person, you know, buying four hundred squares of roofing this week is probably going to want to go to SRS. So it's a it's a depot term, um, and I think it probably is a nod to that this industry is a lot more complex than it looks on the surface. Great. Thanks, Matt. And and Joe's wondering, what is your um, analytical basis for this, for when you said that excess savings was exhausted? He said, uh, household holdings of assets and savings and demand deposits is still very high, uh, looking at the detail of M2 estimates. Yeah. So we don't think M2 is uh, the number that we would settle on, um, mm -hmm. although we have seen M2 come back. So what I would do is I would point you to the excellent research that's been published by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. They have their own cal calculations and tabulations of the excess pandemic pandemic era savings. And uh, they actually publish a monthly series of uh, how much excess savings they've indexed. Essentially, it's the save household savings level uh, pre-March of 2020. Uh, and where it would have to be today. And so uh, they track that. That's a publishable series you can go look at. And the last number I saw in January, uh, it was if you just divide out the the month over month change versus the level, that's the burn rate. So um, that's data that uh, there's a whole team of researchers that that do great work on. You can go check out. Fantastic. Um, Jess is asking, why have larger contractor backlogs deteriorated so much more than smaller contractors in 2023? Yeah, so uh, that's an excellent question because intuitively what we would expect it is, uh, well, you know, kind of makes sense that the smallest ones should be hurt the most. What we think is happening is basically the broader market declined, but you had some uh, smaller maintenance and repair projects that mm -hmm. still had to be done and they got skewed and pushed towards the smaller contractors because those tend to be the contractors that are most willing to move on prices and therefore got the work. So uh, it's kind of a virtue of... Uh, uh, just a, a, a mix shift and a pricing sensitivity issue. Excellent. Well, thank you, Todd. Uh, Charlotte's asking when the cost versus value will be published. Char Charlotte, uh, we are targeting April 19th. So you can look for that in a couple of weeks. We will have that out. Um, oh, we just got another yeah, one. And, and the only the only footnote I would add to that, if it's okay, Amanda, is we're, mm -hmm. we're going to be publishing, a, um, you know, a lot of the traditional information we have some of the information, just like our brand use study, like like the brand component we shared today is probably going to be more um, preserved for suppliers and kind of custom engagements. But uh, but we will be publishing an overview then. Um, thank you. Fantastic. Do we have time for a couple more? Yeah, I think so. All right. Bill came in and he says, do you see, or are you considering any influence from the federal government, um, like IRA or 25C tax credits on the remodeling home improvement industry in any of your analyses? Um, and what are your thoughts on that um, targeted at low to moderate income versus high income, certain specter or sectors <laughs> rather than others and yeah. how will it impact them? Yeah, so so those are all, um, we tend to digest those on a case by case basis, uh, mm -hmm. but from, from, you know, how we've, kind of teed up those credit-based home improvement projects is that we we don't think you actually create any additional home improvement demand in the long run, but you do shuffle around the timing of when they happen. And un unfortunately, it seems like uh, the who benefits the most from those projects 
tends to be those who can also most afford to have some additional dollars to put towards the project that might be at the bubble or at the margin. So you're really not helping, although it's targeting a lot of times the lower income groups, uh, our sense is those groups just are so so cash strapped that it's hard for them to make the purchase. Uh, and as a as a, an analogy from another industry, there's some really excellent research that was done around the cash for clunkers uh, about, what was it, 10, 10, 15 years ago when that tax credit happened. Uh, if we look at the cohorts of who did the most spending, they were not the lowest income cohorts because it was so hard to buy a car if you didn't ha have much income at that time. It tended to be those who are a little bit higher up in income and you got a little bit of uh, timing change. So we think that probably what will happen is the uh, kind of mid to high-ish income cohort could be the one to benefit from that. Um, and uh, hopefully that 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 could, you know, I, I'll speak for myself. I did a solar project last year. And I was very happy to uh, to get the uh, the tax credit as we filed this spring, um, mm -hmm. but of course we were we were able to do that because of other circumstances too. So we were grateful. All right, if we if you want to take one more, Joshua came in with a good one. What are your thoughts on how more traditional distributors will respond to Home Depot entering the complex pro market? Matt, go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> I'd love to I'd love to have lunch and talk about that one. Um, <laughs> When you say traditional, I am assuming you're talking about kind of those wholesalers, pro dealers, um, you know, the, the ABCs of the world and Lansing's and and perhaps lumber yards. Um, <clears throat> I would expect we're going to see more and more partnerships. I, I think in the past, uh, the traditional distributors have allowed homeowners to come in when, you know, in in lean times and, uh, you know, kind of when they would come in and pay, pay cash, keep it simple, get to the end of the line behind all the pros, I think we're going to start to see more of an omni-channel mindset among the traditional distributors. You know, what could that look like? Uh, lumber yards doing a lot more to promote to homeowners, um, even dealers doing that, more partnerships between these uh these traditional pros and uh and retail channels i think uh i think this is gonna i, I think what the depot has done is really going to change the landscape a good amount um but that said i think they're also going to be very careful to not put depot logos on all of the new uh all of the new srs and heritage locations that they just purchased i think you know that it, it is not going to be uh Kind of in your face branded to all of the contractors you know that that hey now uh now it's the same people that you might feel like you're competing with at times so yeah i i think that's going to be a really interesting one to watch unfold joshua excellent well thank you everyone we're at the top of the hour and we are going to go ahead and wrap up here as todd that said thank you so much to our sponsor trek for for sponsoring this webinar if you guys can take our survey at the end and we can give you any follow-up information that you're interested in Thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much, Todd and Matt, for your expertise and your wonderful presentation today. Everyone have a great day. Thanks so much, Amanda. Thanks, everyone.